Hi, I'm Joth Hunt. I'm one of the regional ministers for Southern Counties Baptist Association. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you today. I've brought you here to this woodland, which is not far from my home. It's called Upper Barn Copse. And it's fairly well known because of the bluebells that appear this time of year. So if you see behind me, this, this green behind me will be a carpet of blue in a few weeks time. And I love coming here because it reminds me that the winter is behind us, that spring has come and that the summer is ahead of us. During this period of COVID, it feels a bit like there's been a long winter, but we are looking forward to the summer when gradually restrictions are being eased and we can get back to some form of normality. So I wanted to come and share with you here and particularly to go back to a, a, a book that I've been returning to quite often in, in, during this period of COVID. And it's the, it's the letter that Paul writes to the Philippians. I don't know about you, but I found certain bits of scripture really helpful during this time. And Philippians is one of those books, partly because it was written out of lockdown and Paul wrote it in prison, but also it was written to a church that was facing challenges and was in difficulty. And so I found it really helpful that a number of the things that Paul writes are applicable to the situation that we have found ourselves in in uh, recent months. But I particularly today want to focus on chapter 3 and uh, the verses that I want to focus on particularly are verse 10 and 11. When Paul writes these words, I want to know Christ, yes to know the power of the resurrection and participation in his sufferings to become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. The context of this chapter is that Paul has given them uh, th three commands. And those commands are firstly to rejoice in the Lord. That's a theme that he comes back to time and time again in Philippians. And it's actually a theme that he builds. At first he encourages them to rejoice. And then in chapter 3, at the beginning of chapter 3, he says to them, rejoice in the Lord. And then eventually in chapter, uh, later in his, his, his writings, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Paul is encouraging the church that in this time of difficulty, in this time of challenge, there is something far greater and far more wonderful that has taken place. That is, that trumps everything and makes everything look very different. Even to the extent that he can write in a place of prison that there is joy in God, there is joy in the Lord. I'm pretty convinced that Paul particularly has in mind his conversion on the Damascus Road when he sees the risen Christ. And when he sees the risen Lord Jesus Christ, everything changes. All that he has learned, all that he has known, he puts to one side because now he has seen Jesus, the risen one, the resurrected one. And in that resurrection, there is joy. The second command that Paul gives is to watch out. And he encourages them to watch out for some of the teaching that has been taking place that draws people back into the rituals, the religious rituals that is meant to seal their salvation. And Paul wants to say to them, all those things, circumcision, the fact that you were born a Jew, the fact that you might have been a Pharisee, the fact that you live according to the law, all these things fade into complete insignificance when you are face to face with the risen Lord Jesus. And that he refuses, he says, he refuses to boast in these things. Which brings him to his third command. And his third command is that I will boast in Christ alone. I won't boast in the fact that I was a Pharisee. I won't boast in the fact that I was born a Jew. I won't boast in the fact that I was circumcised on the eighth day. I won't boast in any of these things because none of these things are greater than 
the resurrection, the power of the resurrection found in Jesus Christ. Which brings him to this verse, this verse where he is able to say to them, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of the resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So let me just spend a little bit of time, if I may, just looking at these, these two verses together, verses 10 and 11, and just unpacking them a little bit about why the power, and part, the power of the resurrection and the participation of Christ's sufferings are held together in such a way and why they are so important to Paul and maybe how they can be applied to our situation, our circumstances that we find ourselves in today. What I find fascinating about this passage is the way that Paul uses an old Jewish style of writing uh, that you often find in the Psalms, the chiastic pattern. And so what he says is, he talks about the power of the resurrection and then the participation in Christ's sufferings. He then says, becoming like him in death and then goes back to the resurrection by saying, attaining to the resurrection of the dead. He holds the, the suffering and death of Jesus Christ and he wraps it up in the resurrection of Christ and the power that can be seen within that. I don't know if you've ever considered the ampersand sign for and. In fact, it has a very specific grammatical purpose. And its purpose is to hold two things together that shouldn't be separated. If you said steak and kidney pie and you wrote and in the middle, the word and, instead of the symbol, the ampersand symbol, what you would actually be saying is that there's a piece of steak and then alongside it there is a kidney pie. But of course that's not what we want to say. So the ampersand, what the ampersand does is actually tells the reader that it is a, it is a steak and kidney pie. The steak and the kidneys are in the pie together. They are held together. And the chiastic pattern does exactly the same thing. Paul is saying to his readers that you cannot separate the power of the resurrection from the participation in Christ's suffering. We will never know the power of the resurrection until we step in to the participation of Christ's suffering. And when we step into the participation of Christ's suffering, we can do so with confidence knowing that the power of the resurrection is also as because of what Christ has done. Let's look at these two things again before we put them back together again, the power of the resurrection and the participation in Christ's suffering. The word power conjures up all kinds of thoughts and feelings, emotions even, and when we think of human power, human strength, we, we often think of power being wrapped up with those that have rather than those that haven't. We might think of people that have money, have, have political influence, ha have status perhaps, um, or, or even just physical strength. Physical strength can be a form of power. But the power that Paul is talking about is completely different. The power of the resurrection is, is none of those things. When we think of Jesus' own power, I mean, he had no money. He, he had no political influence. He, he had no position or, or status. He, he, was a, he was a self selected rabbi. Um, he wasn't even appointed by another rabbi, so it, it gave him no status, particularly. Um, he, he was a fairly weak character and, and, and actually at the end he had no physical strength as they placed him upon the cross. So it does beg the question of what is this power of the resurrection? And the power of the resurrection 
is completely different. It's not human power, it's a divine power. It's a power where weakness is turned to strength. It's a power where, where, where sickness is turned to health. Where, where the lost are found. Where the blind are given their sight. It's, it's a power where those who are lost can be found. It's a, it's a power where, where those who have died are given their life back. This is a power unlike anything that we see or discover. It's a power beyond us. It's not something we can manufacture, it's not something we can make up, it's not something that we, we can do ourselves. It's not within our own strengths, it's only in the strength of God. And what I find fascinating is that this power of the resurrection, and I've been learning this time and time again through this COVID period, is that it requires patience. You can't conjure it up with a fancy prayer. But what you can do is you wait on God to do only what God can do. It's a power that is a gift to us. And it's not surprising, therefore, as Paul discovered this power in meeting Jesus himself, the resurrected Christ, it's not surprising then that he writes to the Philippians time and time again, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. This amazing, remarkable power of the resurrection has taken place in Christ. And as it's taken place in Christ, it will also take place in you as you seek to follow him. But Paul doesn't just talk about the power of the resurrection. He's also talking about participating in the sufferings of Christ. The power flows from the suffering. None, none of us would ever want to go looking for suffering. And particularly we would not want to do so in the kind of suffering that Christ went through for us on the cross itself. But what he's writing is that as we go through suffering, as we go through challenges, as we go through times of difficulty, and, and let's face it, you know, our time our season with COVID has not been anything like what Jesus went through for us, what Paul went through in terms of his suffering for the gospel and what the Philippian church itself experienced. But there is an element of challenge and there is an element of difficulty and an element of suffering. But in that suffering, Paul reminds us that we are participating in Christ Jesus, which is where our strength comes from. We are not called to strength but to weakness. We are not called to reign but to serve. We're not called to be in control but to be humble. We're not called to succeed but to be faithful. We're not called to live but to lay down our lives. And we are not called to win but to follow. The church is at its strongest when it's at its weak, weakest. It's at that point that God can do some of the most remarkable and miraculous things that we could ever imagine and has done in the past and will continue to do in the future. I shall never forget the scene. It was around the bed of Bernard Stuttle and, and Bernard was suffering and actually coming to the end of his life with motor neurone disease. And I stood around his bed with, with a group of young people that had been on, on mission with us. Uh, they'd just done a, a presentation downstairs to the, to, the, to the other residents of the home that lived with, with Bernard. But Bernard was too ill to be there, so we took them up to meet and to, uh, to talk with Bernard. Bernard wasn't able to say a great deal, but he did say this, and I think it was his greatest ever sermon. He said to those eight to ten young people, he said this, with, with very little breath in his lungs, he said, to follow Jesus is the greatest adventure you will ever have. Those young people didn't stop talking 
about that moment with Bernard in his room. As they watched this weak individual, God, through that weakness, through that suffering, impacted their life. And they realised that the power of God is seen in weakness. So as we participate in his suffering, so we discover that God does something, yes, miraculous, yes, powerful through us. So my prayer is that as the church comes out of COVID through this period of weakness, that people will see the glory and the wonder of God. So as Paul comes to the end of this chapter in chapter three, he moves on from talking about the power of the resurrection and participating in Christ's sufferings. And he goes on to encourage them to press on. And when he talks about pressing on, he's not talking about just, uh, well, we've got nothing better to do, or where else would we go? And we kind of just shrug our shoulders and keep going. What he means is that we press on because of the power of the resurrection, because of our participation in Christ's sufferings, and because we, we know that that power will, will raise us, will lift us into that new place in God, that we might press on with confidence in our feet, stepping forward, whatever is before us. And as we come out of this, this winter of COVID, we don't know what is ahead, but we might step forward into the future with confidence in Christ Jesus. That we step into the future with hope, with a certainty that God is with us and God will work through us and that the grace and goodness and peace and love of Christ might be seen in his church. But we might also step on, press on, with joy on our faces, rejoicing in all that God has done. We have known suffering, we have known scars, but we have also known the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so Paul says we can press on with confidence, with hope and with rejoicing. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. God bless you.